Therefore, it's time for member statements. The member from Sarnia Lampton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's my privilege to rise in the legislature and officially recognize November 19th to November 22nd, 26th as Scottish Rite Week in Canada. The term Scottish Rite is a short form for the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of Canada. The presence of the Scottish Rite in Canada dates back to the early days of Canada itself, with the first Scottish Rite body operative in Hamilton, Ontario in 1868. Canada's Supreme Council office is still located in Hamilton to this day. On November 22nd, as part of Scottish Rite Week festivities, the Sarnia Lodge of Perfection will celebrate 50 years of Scottish Rite masonry in the Sarnia Valley at Sarnia Masonic Hall. At the heart of membership in the Scottish Rite is a commitment to charity. The Scottish Rite Charitable Foundation uh, funds many worthwhile initiatives, including eight learning centres for children with dyslexia located in London, Windsor, Halifax, Vancouver, Moncton, Barrie, Calgary, and Edmonton. These centers provide free tutoring for children to help them overcome their reading difficulties and by training a growing cadre of highly skilled and dedicated tutors. Mr. Speaker, please join me in thanking the members of the Scottish Rite for the charitable work that they do, and together let's recognize and celebrate Scottish Rite Week in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. So there are members of the the member from Windsor to come see. Good afternoon, Speaker. I'd like to give a shout out to the good folks who run the business improvement area in the town of Tecumseh. I was a guest last Saturday evening at the BIA's 52nd annual Christmas party. It was a wonderful evening at the Torino Plaza and Banquet Hall. A delicious turkey dinner with all the trimmings, music by stiletto fire. Dennis Marinted had his photo booth available. Plenty of holiday hats, glasses, feather boas, and other fun trinkets to spice up those holiday photos. Speaker, one thing about the good folks at the Tecumseh BIA, they love to have fun. So hats off to BIA Chair Candace Dennis, Treasurer Paul Bastani, Vice Chair Tony Nimi, and the directors, Joseph Frangeli, Maureen Harris, Daniel Hofgartner, Linda Proctor, and Town Councillor Andrew Dowie. As you know, Speaker, the work behind the scenes of what pulls an organization together in Tecumseh, the BIA coordinator is Paula Rorai, and the administrative assistant is Anne Cookie Rijo. They balance the needs of 550 members. The BIA and Town Council will be holding an annual Santa Claus parade on Friday evening. And, Speaker, if you are in the area, drop by the Council Chambers after the parade and meet Mr. and Mrs. Claus. They've been making a list and checking it twice, Speaker, and they'll find out. They'll let you know if you've been naughty or nice. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> Member from Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This year marks the 50th anniversary of this Agent Court Mall, a long standing really? community fixture in my riding of wow. Scarborough, Agent Court. Located in what used to be at the historical village of Agent Court, yep. Agent Court Mall opened on November the 23rd, 1966. Even in its 50th year, Agent Court Mall offers various programs to support our community, including the seniors program, Mr. Speaker. Over the past 50 years, Agent Court Mall has grown to over 60 diverse tenants, many of them small businesses run by local residents. The mall management continues to support new and longtime local tenants like the Alma Tours, a family-run business that has been in a mall since the day it opened in 1966. As the first indoor mall opened in the Scarborough area, Agent Court Mall has spent 50 years not just a shopping mall, wow. but a vital landmark a meeting place, a community employer, and a vital hub for Scarborough Agent Court residents. Congratulations to management and tenants of Agent Court Mall for the 50th anniversary. And Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward to celebrating this milestone with them this Saturday, it's November the 26th. Thank you, Mr. Sp Speaker. Thank you. Further members, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today to highlight National Pulmonary Hypertension Month. Pulmonary hypertension is a rare and life-threatening disease that can affect anyone regardless of their age, sex, or race. People between the ages of 20 and 60 are most affected, and certain forms of pulmonary hypertension are more common in women. This chronic, life-changing disease causes high blood pressure in the lungs, while, while if left undetected, causes right-side heart failure. Pulmonary hypertension is difficult to diagnose, and if left undiagnosed, can lead to death within two to three years. 
Approximately 5,000 Canadians are living with pulmonary hypertension, while as many as 10,000 may be living with this disease undiagnosed. Symptoms of pulmonary hypertension include persistent and unexplained shortness of breath, chest pain, bluish lips, hands and feet, dizziness from standing up, climbing stairs, fainting, fatigue, and swollen ankles and legs. In 1997, nine pulmonary hypertension treatments were approved in Canada, which allows for 50 percent of patients today to survive five years or more past initial diagnosis. Today, as we celebrate National Pulmonary Hypertension Month, we have the chance to further the discussion around pulmonary hypertension and the opportunity to ensure all Canadians have access to publicly funded treatments from their diagnosis and beyond. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Pulmonary Hypertension Society of Canada for their advocacy and research, and to the many caregivers and volunteers across the province who work tirelessly advocating for a cure to this terrible disease. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Further member statements. The member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, once again, if we listen outside on our lawn, we have some upset Ontario residents who are there from across this province, particularly from Ontario Alliance Against School Closures. Uh, it's a challenge that is facing each and every community across this riding, particularly mine in northern Ontario, where there are small communities that are being affected, and their identity and their hope and their services are being pulled away from them by facing the fact that their schools are going to be closed. Uh, I have a particular constituent of mine. His name is Larry Killens, who is a trustee and has been working extremely hard in order to make sure that those services are in. And I want to quote Mr. Mr. Killens, where he has said, this has nothing to do with the decisions being made by the board or administration. I have full confidence the accommodation review will be done in the least intrusive way to our schools in these recommendations. Closing schools is the last resort. I want, to, I want the accommodation review to be put on hold by our board until parliamentary votes are to restore funding. And that's what they're asking for, is that that's the extent that our trustees are going to towards their boards in order to ask that. But when the board is faced with provincial cuts and this particular board, 3.6 million to offset provincial reductions, that's ludicrous. How can they be put into that position to making those changes? Nobody says these decisions are easy. Nobody says that this is going to be a tough process. But take a break. Step back, hold off on your decision, and let's see what we can do when we're looking at revisiting the funding model because it's absolutely needed across this province. Further member statements, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and uh, I had the pleasure of joining uh, Premier uh, Wynne and former Premier McGuinty and Minister Nackvi at uh, a celebration, uh, a celebration of solidarity at Congregation Mazihi Hadas in Ottawa, uh, in response to the acts of hate that have happened in our community, and we are joined by many, many faith leaders uh, and more, and many other civic officials, and more importantly, people from all walks of life were there. It was really an incredible celebration and a show of solidarity. And I want to thank Rabbi Boka and Rabbi Sher for welcoming us into the synagogue and hosting us for that celebration. It really was a very special, uh, a special event. And I want to read the prayer uh, that uh, Rabbi Bolt, that the, was provided to all of us there from all of the faith leaders. It's an expression of solidarity and gratitude. And these are the final lines. We are strong because we are resolute in our togetherness. We are even stronger because we are cooperative in our diversity. We gather to focus on the good that inheres in all of us. We gather to extol the mosaic that defines who we are. We gather to celebrate the beauty of our community, and we gather to express our gratitude for the wonderful people who comprise this great city, our nation's capital, and we gather to be thankful for living in this caring country, Canada. We resolve individually and collectively to do all within our power to assure that this is the Canada that our children and theirs will inherit. Amen. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. It's with great pride that I rise today on behalf of my residents of Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry to recount how they came together to join other re regions across the province in sending a message to this government that their current policies in education is negatively affecting rural Ontario. When the pupil accommodation review was leaked, was leaked last in late September, many students and educators broke down in tears at the announcement that approximately 20 local schools may close in my riding. Our community quickly organized, holding numerous large public meetings and demonstrations across the riding. Volunteers stepped up to make the required accommodation review committees and spending endless hours 
to meet the, the SKU public accommodation review guidelines. Speaker, hundreds of people from every community are gathering to fight the latest assault in rural Ontario. Last Monday, over 600 attended the first review meeting, and students are walking out of class in an organized protest of the closings. And Speaker, more than two busloads from Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry braved the storm yesterday and this morning to join other regions of, the, of this province demanding that the government intervene. Yeah. Speaker, I have tabled a motion and a petition asking the Minister of Education to, to suspend the current pupil accommodation reviews until a comprehensive review of rural education is conducted, in engaging all school boards, community, com uh, school communities, and rural municipalities. Minister, please stand up for rural Ontario. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this year, 17-year-old Justin Masadi was diagnosed with a rare form of brain cancer. This cancer forms unlike other cancers. It infiltrates the brain in a way that makes it extremely difficult to treat. Justin and his family were told that alternative cancer treatment might help. However, OHIP does not cover treatment for the so-called experimental treatment that Justin needed to access. As a result, the Masadis were forced to take out a $200,000 loan in order to seek alternative cancer treatment in Mexico. This treatment has actually worked and is saving Justin's life. His family urgently needs coverage to fund the continuation of his care. The Masadis have pleaded to the Premier to take action on this matter, only to be met with an OHIP coverage rejection letter. Speaker, this youth has an extremely rare form of cancer that we cannot treat traditionally here in Ontario. And now what our province calls experimental treatment is saving his life. This government should be supporting this success. A life is being saved. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, on compassionate grounds, should commit to funding the transportation and medical costs associated with the out-of-country cancer treatment of Justin Masadi. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to share with you today news of a, an event in Kitchener which I attended recently, the German Remembrance Service. Now, tucked away in a corner of the Woodlawn Cemetery in Kitchener, 187 German prisoners of war have found their final resting place. These soldiers died in Canada during the First and Second World Wars. While the Second World War ended more than 70 years ago, the German Soldier Cemetery has only been in Kitchener for 40 years. Initially, these men were buried in 36 different locations across Canada, but they were relocated in the early 1970s in an attempt to bring them all together in one place. They now lie side by side with their colleagues. We gather on German Remembrance Day in Kitchener to commemorate all of the needless victims of the past through war and through suffering. On this day, mayors of Kitchener and Waterloo laid down their wreaths side by side. We were joined by MPs. I was there to represent the province of Ontario. And we also had many members of Canadian legions there, representatives of German Canadian organizations such as clubs, associations, schools, and churches. And we all were there together to remember these people who gave their lives in conflict so many years ago. It now stands as an example of how people can live peacefully together despite their different histories. And that's an important lesson for all of us to remember. Thank you. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's